Well, we're pleased to have Caleb Smith and his wife Brianna with us tonight. We're thankful that they made a safe trip from Ward Lake. Uh, no water problems on their way down, but uh, let's hope there's no water problems on your way back. I got caught in that stuff today and it, uh, it wasn't fun. But uh, we're glad that you're here this evening. Caleb was born and raised in Colorado. He went to York College in York, Nebraska, where he majored in Bible with an emphasis in ministry. And they've been, uh, spent eight years as a youth minister in Omaha, Nebraska, while his wife was completing her doctorate. And we're so happy that they're here. How long have you been at Wald Lake, Caleb? Uh, eight months. Eight months at Wald Lake. So you're still new? And uh, very much so, you're the newbie at Wald Lake, but we're glad that you're the newbie here at Lincoln Park, and we're looking forward to your message. So, take over. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to up here. Ooh, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, first things first, uh, let me just say what an absolute honor, blessing, and privilege it is uh, to join you tonight. In fact, we're kind of like awestruck at how awesome the building is. We were kind of like appreciating the entire place over here a while ago. Uh, so thank you for letting us be here. Uh, last week, Roger was the speaker, the teacher, and uh, he is now an elder at our church, but was previously the minister where I am now minister. Uh, so he got a little run of you guys. I'm so glad that I get the chance to now. Uh, and I really like the topic for tonight, for the whole summer series. If you had one last lesson to teach, uh, and my mind went a million places at once. <laughs> in fact, I kind of had an existential crisis. Because I was like, one last lesson. What, what's happening to my life? But that's <laughs> not uh, the point. But then I, I started to think, should we do a last lesson that I would teach? Is it going to be super mysterious and heavy and hard and try to uncover all the mysteries we don't know? And I thought, I'm not that smart. Uh, so instead, <laughs> what we'll do is something very straightforward and honest and simple as I think much of ministry should be for many people around the world, is honest, straightforward, simple, easy to understand, but still has incredible depth uh, because our God is very deep. So how we're going to start this evening is a little different. We're going to do a little warm-up for a moment. Uh, class tonight starts with what happened to me during COVID. Uh, I had a lot of time to myself, which is never a good thing, uh, but I got obsessed with these things called collective nouns. And if you know what those are, it's just the thing that we call a group of something. Uh, for example, we'll start real easy. Uh, a group of cows. What do you call a group of cows? Herd. A herd. A Absolutely. Uh, we'll go to, like, for example, sheep. What do you call a group of sheep? A flock. A flock of sheep. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but some get kind of weird. For example, we could talk about what do you call a group of crows? Murder. Know? Murder. A murder. A murder of crows for some reason. Uh, you can track this back to way ancient times where they would find these crows following armies because death was coming, so they'd go and follow them, so it became a bad omen, so they'd say, that's a murder of crows. <laughs> so it's, it's this weird thing where outside observers kind of look in at these animals, these groups, and they see how their characteristics are, they see how they interact, and they give them a collective noun. So what we're going to do really quick, those are kind of the normal ones that most people know. We're going to step through some more. Now, if you know them, leave a little bit of time so people can make their guesses, and then we'll <laughs> talk about that in a second. So for example, a giraffe. If you see a group of giraffes in the wild, what would their collective noun be? What do you, what do you think? Just shout them out. Think about their characteristics. Think about what they look like. Any, any guesses at all? Ooh, long necks. I like that. Uh, these are a tower. A tower of giraffes is what they're called in, in the group setting because they look like a tower. Uh, so we're kind of we're getting it. Uh, think about hyenas for a moment. What do you call a group of hyenas in the wild? Think about what they do. What are your guesses? A pack. Pack, close, we're getting there. Think about hyenas, what they do, what they sound like, a laughing, ooh, close. These are called a cackle, a cackle of hyenas. We're getting it, we're, we're moving. Uh, let's go to flamingos for a second. What do you call a group of flamingos in the wild if you'd see them? A doodle. A doodle? I like doodle, I do like doodle. Uh, other guests, what do you think? Well, the first letter, it's an F. These are called a flamboyance, a flamboyance of flamingos. That kind of fits. They're very flamboyant in their nature. It's wonderful. Uh, let's go here. How about some porcupines? What would you call a group of porcupines you saw in the wild? Hmm? That, it is a prickle, a prickle of porcupines. You get 10 points. I don't know what that gets you, but you got 10 points right there. Uh, yeah, you call them up because you can see they're very prickly, so it's a prickle of porcupines. Uh, how about some owls for a moment? 
what would you call a group of owls? Think about what they're associated with, how they look, what they do. Acute, their acuteness of owls. Close. What do you think? Any guesses? A hoot? Oh, I wish it was a hoot. Uh, these are called a parliament because they're associated with wisdom. Owls, and you've heard that, so they look like they're in Parliament, a Parliament of Owls, that's good. Uh, but some get kind of hardcore. For example, we could talk about vultures for a moment. Now when you think about what vultures do, their characteristics, what is their collective noun? What are your guesses? Hmm. Uh, vipers. Oh, vipers of vultures? Oh, uh, not vipers, we're close, we're getting there. Piggies? Uh, this one's kind of hardcore. Oh, you have a guess? No. Oh, these are, this one kind of has a hardcore. You call a group of vultures a wake. Okay. Now, if you don't know what a wake is, that's kind of where you sit up with the dead, mm -hmm. kind of watch over them. So when you think about what vultures do, it's kind of brutal, isn't it? That's kind of hardcore. Uh, and some aren't very nice. Uh, we could talk about pandas, for example. Uh, think about what they are, their characteristics. What would you call a group of pandas? Pack, not a pack close, we're getting there. A Pandora. <laughs> oh, a Pandora, I like that. Uh, their official collective noun is an embarrassment. <laughs> Think about, because if you watch pandas, they're not graceful creatures. Uh, they're an embarrassment of pandas, their official collective noun. Uh, or we can go to hippos, for example. What would you call a collective noun for hippos in the wild? Dangerous. <laughs> Dangerous. Dangerous of hippos, I like that. Pod. Pod? I like pod, I like pod. Uh, you call these a bloat, a bloat of hippos, a bloat, because they, <laughs> it's pretty personal. Uh, and then my personal favorite, though, is lemurs. Uh, what do you call a group of lemurs in the wild? If you were to see it from the outside and look in, what would you call them? Cute. Any guesses? A cute, more cute, a lot of cute animals. Uh, this is called a conspiracy, oh. a conspiracy of lemurs because these outside observers will look in and see when they're kind of planning up there and like trying to avoid prey, they look like they're conspiring together. So it's a conspiracy of lemurs. Mm -hmm. And so that got me thinking in a lot of different ways. I wonder if there were multiples of me, what mine would be, like a balding of Caleb's out there in the wild for you to all look at. <laughs> oh, there goes a socially awkward of Caleb across the way, I don't know. Uh, but there's one more I want to talk about and that's where we're really going to dig in tonight. What do you call the group of things that meets in this church? Christians. Christians. So just shout out. What do you call yourselves? What do we call the church? Family. family. I like family. What else we got? Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. That was simultaneous and very good, yes. <laughs> what else we call it? Disciples. Church. Disciples. Yes. We have all these great names that we have a fellowship of believers, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a family, all these wonderful things. Body. What's that? A body, a body of Christ, amen and amen. Uh, but here's where things get uncomfortable. And so again, for tonight, please feel free to toss some comments, questions, anything. I want this to be very much a, a dialogue. Uh, but the thing is, if the outside world were to look in, because again, these poor animals don't get to decide what they're called. I don't think any hippo wants to be called a bloat of hippos. <laughs> but when you think about what the world looks in on, and they look into a church, they look at Christians, what kind of things do you think the world would call us, good or bad. What do you think? A court. Friendly. Huh? A court. A court of Christians. Like Supreme Court is what I was thinking, like judging, Ooh. right? Mm -hmm. Judgmental. See what I mean? Yeah. A judgmental? Judgmental. Like that. Ooh, a hypocrisy of Christians? A friendliness of Christians? Other things, what do you got? Shout them out. Kindness. A kindness of Christians? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A loving group. A loving group, yes. Ooh, someone say cult? A cult of Christians? An evangelical of Christians? Yes, there are so many from all different areas. Because some people, yes, it is a kindness. It is a warmth of Christians. A loving of Christians. But to some, it's a judgment of Christians. A hypocrisy of Christians. Maybe a pompous of Christians. There are plenty of things we could talk about that what makes Christians Christians. But the thing is, again, we don't get to decide that. All we can decide to do right now tonight is decide what kind of church we're going to be. Regardless of how people view us, it's how we are going to show them who God is. So really quick, if you want to grab a Bible and follow along, we're going to go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Uh, this to me is a great description of what I think a church looks like. Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord then, 
I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended (coughs) higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Amen? Amen. 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 That's a beautiful description of how it's supposed to look. We grow up together. And yes, he sets them to be teachers and apostles and also to prepare God's body for works of service. So when the world looks in on us, the collective noun can change from something so negative to something like, oh, there goes a working of Christians. There goes a family, a body, a maturity of Christians. Even all these words we just read here, shaping our collective noun to the world. So then just the first question, kind of to get the dialogue going a little bit, how can we better do this today? In a world that is full chaos most of the time, how do we as a church, and notice I'm saying we, even though I met from a different church, But no, we are the church. So how do we as a church make sure we're more molded like this? So when people look in from the outside, they pick these words that better align with what we're supposed to be. How do we do that, do you think? Caring for others. Caring Caring for for others. others. Mm -hmm. What else you got? More studying. More studying? Getting together, study more, absolutely. Other takers, how do we better represent what we're supposed to be as a body? Encourage others in their growth. Mm. I'm into that. By working. By working. By working. Paul talks about the different parts of the body, human body, mm-hmm. and uh, having a function. And he compares that to the Christian, the church, the body of the church. Mm-hmm. Each part of that body has a function. And if we fulfill that function, then the, everything works smoothly, and we can accomplish a great deal more than if we were just one part of the body trying to do everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We also have to work. As, as a unit, uh, in unity uh, with each other to bring all of us and all of our members to salvation. Mm-hmm. That's, our, that's our goal. Mm-hmm. That's one over here. Is that something? Yeah. Uh, forgiveness, the way Christ forgave us. Mm. As Christ forgave us. Yeah, not like regular forgiveness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amen to that. Huge. The takers. Evangelizing. Willingness. Evangelizing. Amen to that. Willingness. Where that one come from? I said willingness. Willingness. Amen to that. Uh, commitment. Commitment. I love it. Imitators of God. Imitators of God. Amen, amen. Maybe make sure that we're not hypocrites. Ooh, make sure we're not hypocrites. That's a big challenge. I'm not smart enough for either, but that's good. Make sure we're not hypocrites. Amen. And all these answers, by the way, I think go into that collective noun spot. A willingness of Christians. A working of Christians. A healthy body of Christians. Those are all great examples. Perseverance. Uh, What's that? Perseverance. A perseverance of Christians. Amen and amen. Uh, and so to kind of go to where an example of where it actually is exactly describing the church and its work, uh, let's go to Acts 2. And again, a lot of these are verses you've probably read. And I'm not going to promise any new revelation or super deep thought, but I'm just going to say this is how we can be today. Acts 2. You've Acts 2, verse uh, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They (coughs) broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now again, I'm not sure how things work here, but I will say for the church as a whole, at least in my experience, uh, most Sundays have a time limit in a sense. And we're actually, I was actually talking before and how we shouldn't treat it that way as much anymore. But at Walled Lake at least, it's usually like about an hour is how far we go. And the, the longer you go after an hour, people start kind of checking their watches a little bit. But then if you look at this church, it's every day they were meeting together. Every day they were breaking bread together. Every day they were doing these things. And they gained the favor of all the people. So they became a favor of Christians. Everyone looking in on them and saying, I see how this works. And daily, the number was growing. That's kind of in contrast to what we see today. In fact, churches in a lot of places are shrinking by number. And it's, it's a scary thought, yeah, but again, it's this idea that if we form ourselves back to who we're supposed to be as a church and treat people like we're supposed to treat people as a church, then we become a better collective now. So now we get real uncomfortable, and I'm, I'm not afraid to do that because I don't know many of you personally, so <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but quick question to you. I want you to think for a moment of a person that you disagree with the absolute most. I'm talking at the, the other end of the spectrum from where you are. I'm talking like the last person you'd expect or want to see or have any kind of time with. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't have anyone like that. Then just go as far as you can. But for many of us, it's that person or the kind of, kind of person we can't imagine being with. How in the world do we make them see a better collective now? How do we make them look at us at a church that are so diametrically opposed from us to see God? Because, yes, we have the answers for ourselves. We mentioned earlier, more studying together, which is amazing, and showing we're not hypocrites, all that stuff. But for these real situations, what can you do? So when they're looking at you, they see not a bad collective noun, a hypocrisy or a judgment or a snootiness of Christian, but they see God. How do you make that personal? Patience and kindness. Those are hard words, though, aren't they? Yes, they are. What are the thoughts? I always look at it this way. Um, you know, we got to roll up our sleeves. You know, mm-hmm. we may have to get dirty. We may have to do things that we don't want to do, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. we know that that's the, the best thing to do. I look at that's kind of what God did with Jesus. He's like, hey, listen, you guys just don't get it, so i got to go down there, roll my sleeves up, and show you how it's done. Mm-hmm. And we still don't get it half the time, mm-hmm. you know? Well, the facts. How do we make it that personal? Yeah. I think it's uh, easier to open up to. I, it's easier to get somebody else to open up if you're willing to open up. For instance, mm-hmm. I find myself in several conversations discussing a church with somebody who doesn't go or has a predis- uh, predisposition on it uh, about you know this hypocrite idea. Like maybe I need to explain some issues that I have that you know, and I can say I'm working on these, and I see in the Bible that I need to fix these. That's my example, but. I have things I'm working on. Instead of saying, hey, I go to church every Sunday, you should too, mm-hmm. here's what you're doing. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's, people's defenses are up. Yeah, come on. Other thoughts? Yeah. This is kind of a hard one, but finding a way to interact with them, with, you know, with this person or people, whoever they are, um, without um, compromising our Christianity. Mm. Mm-hmm. It, it's a hard spot to be in sometimes. You know, to try to be not maybe in their world, but you know, somewhere, you know, being able to relate with them mm-hmm. without messing ourselves up. <laughs> Absolutely. So sometimes it's it's easy and it's natural to uh, to judge somebody. For example, a panhandler mm-hmm. on the side of the expressway. It's easier to say, well, that, that person looks like they haven't had a bath in in a year and a half, and and they're probably driving an expensive car and, and stopping every day off the bank. You don't know. You, you make these judgments. But when you start to do that, what you need to do is look past that. You know, we, I don't have a clue how that person got here, where they came from, mm. or what put them in this position. And somehow you just have to get past what you suspect is the case and try to, try to extend some love. You, 
you never know what that's going to do. And that, that could make a big difference for that person. Mm -hmm. I mentioned one, uh, to one I mentioned earlier, someone said it's like a cult of Christians. And I want to stop there for a moment because especially uh, for the younger generations, in my time as youth minister especially, a lot of kids had the same kind of thought. They said, well, we look like a cult to the outside. And again, to these outside observers who look in and see us, for example, taking communion, which is such a powerful thing. But when they hear, oh, we're remembering the body and blood of a sacrifice, or says, like, whoa, 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 whoa. So, but once you, un once you like, explain and, un and have them understand what it actually means, it's so much deeper than just the cult side, because they are, they're going to see that and freak out. But we say, no, 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 it means so much deeper than what you're thinking it is. And so if we can show, especially the younger generations, why we do what we do, then it's not just a going through the motions of Christians. No, it's, it's a foundation of Christians as to why things are built the way they are in the church, why we pray, why we worship, why we have communion, all those things that we do that people say, uh, it's kind of culty. We say, no, no, once you understand, it's not a cult at all. In fact, you'll find this is actually a family of Christians or a loving of Christians. Yeah. Um, one of the hardest things that I had to do recently, because I've been away from the church for three years. Mm -hmm. I've had a real hard struggle in my life. But I walked up to everybody I butted heads with and apologized and asked for forgiveness, which was very hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, even though maybe I felt that I was not in the wrong, obviously, but I still went up and apologized. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Amen, amen. Not to make generalizations, as Tom mentioned. Mm -hmm. we, some, we see someone on the side of the road in ragged clothes or with a sign up and we make generalizations. And this individual or individuals that we have trouble with, don't make, don't draw conclusions or generalizations. Um, Paul tells the Ephesians in the church in Ephesus, do everything to glorify God. Mm -hmm. Find a way to glorify God in your approach to these people. Mm -hmm. Whether it's to ask a simple question or to show an act of kindness or whatever it might be, the opportunity might arise for us to do something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad and, you mentioned that too. Oh. And don't return evil for evil or anger for anger. Mm. That happens a lot. Mm -hmm. That person loses control, gets mad at you. The answer is not to do the same thing in return, mm -hmm. but to show patience and kindness, and, uh, which isn't always easy to do. Mm -hmm. what Randy's saying, we, we, <coughs> we are getting more and more and more people around us every minute that are very different from us, mm. and um, we're not always happy about it. Um, generally, we're not happy about what's going on, but, and we, we don't have opportunities to help all these people, but we can always pray for them. We, we, I can't help every person I'm seeing on almost every corner now that's asking for everything, and mm. they all are. But um, uh, but I can pray for them because they're, you know, one way or another, they're having trouble. Just like I need prayers every day, we can pray for people that we can't help even. Mm. And instead of judging them or thinking bad about them, we owe our Father to be praying for who are still his children. What about the verse that says, uh, when you do to the least of these, you do unto me? Mm -hmm. And courage, yeah. right? Oh. And it's, it takes a lot of courage sometimes to approach someone, if you, especially if you've had a disagreement or you're at odds with them. It takes mm. courage to do that. But. Mm. I'm glad you said that last part especially. Uh, because the reason, again, this whole idea came up with collective nouns and unity is what the main focus is, is because during COVID, which I don't like saying that word because of what it did to a lot of people and a lot of churches. And, and regardless of what your stance is about it, uh, it was very, very, very destructive to our church, at least in Omaha. It was tough because on one hand, people are saying you didn't do enough. On the other hand, you didn't do anything. And it's kind of, you're, you're stuck in the middle not knowing what to do. And it's a dangerous topic, too. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about, in theory, that person on the other side from you. Well, let's bring it inside the walls for a second. Because even if you have differing opinions on something that should have been handled differently, when you're now face to face with your brother or your sister in Christ, that in our minds are so different from what we're expecting or what we think we should do, where do we find that unity? Especially when it's like, if I say to you, well, because of how you're doing this, you're not following God. 
And they come back at you and say, well, no, because you are doing this, you're not following God. And it's like all of a sudden, there are two different gods in a sense. And we're saying both are on my side. That's a tough place to be. So then, and when we apply this to the church, when people look in and they see what, how we handled some things or didn't handle some things, and they say that is a disunity of church. That is a chaos of church. How do we make sure that should something else happen like that, happen again, how do we protect ourselves and make sure we're still in this boat of unity and fellowship? Okay. Uh, in Ephesians 4, 2, where your translation said, bearing with one another, mm-hmm. uh, the wording in mind actually said, putting up with one another in love. <laughs> Come on. And, and I love that wording because it really sort of makes plain the sense of what that means. And, mm-hmm. and it goes right to what you're saying is that sometimes, like, even when somebody disagrees with us, like, th- there needs to be that, that forbearance, that, that grace. Like, we're really good with accepting that Jesus gives us grace for what we screwed up, but sometimes we're not so great at extending that same grace to other people. Mm-hmm. Come on. Well, the thoughts on how we manage that when it is a personal church event, church function, church, something that has happened in the world especially where you can have these divides. And it's all of a sudden, it's like a difference in people. Instead of having one body, one faith, one baptism, as we just read, is how the church should be. How do we make sure we stay that way? Yeah. Well, I think during situations like that or times like that, we need to have a lot more lessons on getting along and understanding what you know God wants us to do in these kind of situations. And good leadership in the church is always helpful. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. It, it's hard to not make church about us, mm-hmm. right? When we live in a culture that's about us. Right? You, you look at all the consumerism, it, it points to this is what I want to do, this is what will make me feel better, and then we come to church, this needs to make me feel better, and maybe it doesn't. Mm. Right? And so um, I, I forgot where I heard this, and, 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 and it was interesting, it was in, it was in a book, but you know, there, there's a lot of people that think Christ died for me, and when I say me, just in singular, it, he died for me. Right? He didn't die for him, for me. This is kind of the way we look at it, but when it happened, no, he died for all of humanity, not just me. You know what I mean? And yeah. so sometimes we get confused with that, like, no, he died for me. You know, and, and then we use that as a way to kind of navigate through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Come on. Yeah, I like the idea, especially of coming to church, not for us, but like, what if we're a conviction of Christians? We're like, we're not all called to be all happy, joy, joy all the time. But I was kind of yeah. thinking of like a Ouija board. But, but maybe that's a bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. You, you, you know what I mean? But, but, but the, the idea of that is, you, you know, it's, it's, it's all hands on there, and it just kind of moves with the group conscience. But I, when I get in the church, that that can kind of be a little dangerous, too. But sometimes there's got to be a balance, I think, between mm. the I'm worried two. that Matt believes in that. We <laughs> yeah. It's like, then, got, that's that kind of church. Thought. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Concerned about man. I think sometimes we confuse unity with conformity, Mm -hmm. and we want people to conform to the idea that we have of a Christian versus to unite under Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that Mm -hmm. that's where we get in trouble sometimes. Perfect. And so with that, uh, and again, we can have these kind of theoreticals about Mm -hmm. discussions, but let's go to a biblical example. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to go to John chapter 13 for a moment. John 13, this is again towards the end of his life, about the the garden and the Last Supper, all those things. John 13, starting verse 31. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You'll look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. (coughs) Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. We're going to stop right there for a moment and hone in on something. Uh, Because we take this idea, and it's a beautiful idea, and we say, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We sing that song too. It's a great song. It's a beautiful idea. But when we get specific, he's saying to his disciples, they'll know you belong to me if you love one another. 
if my disciples who go out, their love for each other is so apparent and obvious that it's so different than the other rabbis and their disciples and their families. No, no, they'll, they'll know you belong to me. And think about who he's talking to. On one hand, we have, for example, Matthew the tax collector, and we have Simon the zealot. And if you want to talk about two differing opinions, look no further. Because there are times where anyone like Simon would look to kill someone like Matthew. But here they are as a part of Jesus' disciples. And he's saying, you love one another. And if you love one another, everyone will know you belong to me. So you must love one another. So again, those viewpoints are, they can't go together in any other context. There's no way that would happen. Take the two most diametrically opposed people, <laughs> put them in a room and say, get along. Unless you find this perfect common ground in Christ, it's not going to happen most likely. But he's saying, look, this is going to change the world because people will see that a zealot and a tax collector can go change the world together. What a beautiful idea that is. So when I see people looking into the church, I hope that's what they see, that even though we are divided on so many things, there's one body, one faith, one baptism, just as you were called when you were called. That's how it's supposed to look. Uh, so if we make it very personal like that, now it gets even more uncomfortable because, yes, there are people that we disagree with in church, but at the same time, what holds us together? Yeah. I like what Jesus says in uh, John 17, beginning in verse 21. Oh. In his prayer, uh -huh. uh, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. And then he goes on to give the reason why. Uh -huh. So that the world may believe you sent me. Uh -huh. I'm so glad you brought that up. We're actually going to read that at the very end. So, no, we're, we're on track. <laughs> one faith, one mind, one baptism. Come on, brother. I love it. I love it. Uh, but again, this is where, again, I kind of go to you for your ideas and opinions. Because if you look at the world today, and you see the pain, and you see the chaos, you see the war, you see the differing and the bickering, all the kind of stuff. In your opinion, what do you think the world needs right now? The collective now that the world needs that you think the church could supply? And not just the giant vague ones like a, a godly of Christians. We, yes, amen and amen. But specifically, what do you think the collective noun should be in the world you see? Yeah. A unity of Christians. Amen and amen. Show the world. Other thoughts? What do you think? What do you think the world needs? What, what word would you pick to say the world needs this real bad right about now? We need to be a blank. Peace. What's that? Peace. A peace. Ooh, a peace of Christians. Like sacrificial. That. A sacrificial of Christians. Sacrifice of Christians. Amen. Love. Loving. Loving of Christians. A love of Christians. The world, all the world needs is love, so we love. What else you got? When I say love, I mean sacrificial love is the love which Jesus gave to us. Mm -hmm. Content. Ooh, a content of Christians? I love that one so much. Yeah. I think maybe we need a leadership of Christians. Come on. A leadership of Christians. Mm -hmm. A boldness of Christians. A stand-up of Christians. Yeah. A selflessness of Christians. Selflessness of Christians throughout the world. Amen. Generous. Generous of Christians. Generous of Christians. A generosity of Christians. I like that a lot. Like in the previous passage, glad and sincere. Mm. A gladness, a sincerity. Glad and sincere Christians. Come on. Amen. What takers? What do you got? Yeah. Um, Jesus. A Jesus of Christians. I think these are all attributes of that. Right? Come on. Yeah. A Christ like of Christians. What takers? What do you think the world needs that you could give? Compassion. A compassion of Christians. Amen. Amen. Joy filled. Ooh, a joy filled. Joyful, a joyful of Christians. I like that a lot. First John three sixteen. We know love by this that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Mm -hmm. That's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. I think when you're willing to die for someone, you take a little bit of a different attitude and approach. You're more forgiving. You are more apt to feel what they feel, see their point of view and work things out to save their lives, but you're still willing to lay down your life for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We could probably all, every one of us, think of somebody that we would give our life for. One, one special person, maybe two or three. Now try to, try to imagine anybody, there's only one, but God and Jesus Christ did that for every human being. Mm -hmm. 
Come on. What was Mel Gibson's movie? Uh, help me out. Passion of Christ. When you watch that scene where Christ was on the cross and the tear dropped from God's eye, mm. how did you feel? Mm. I still remember that feeling. I thought you were going to say Braveheart, and like that's going to be a different discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now, because we're kind of at this big point, we're saying, yes, what the world needs, but now let's again zoom in a little bit. Within this church, you personally, right now, I'm talking, if you're in a, a stage of life where things are tough for you, things are hard for you, things are doubt-filled for you, things are painful for you, it's hard to do things correctly, what do you need from your church? I wonder, and I'm not going to make you talk if you don't want to, but I wonder how many of us could benefit from a strength of Christians in here tonight. I wonder who would benefit from a forgiveness of Christians in here tonight, or a, an embrace of Christians tonight. I wonder if you personally say, yes, the world needs this, but here's what I need. And here's what God is saying, here is my body that you can work with to grow into maturity, into the fullness of Christ. Yes, they should supply this for you and you for them. So how many of us need a prayer of Christians, a support of Christians, a warmth of Christians? It's not the whole world that has the problem. It's also within our walls where we have people who don't say a lot of things sometimes. And it's having people look in and see, well, there's no place for me there because I need things that I'm not getting fulfilled out here. And that's where it should be is in here. So again, I wonder what thoughts we have about that. So regardless of, again, where you are tonight or this specific season of life, we like to say, uh, I pray that you are both supplying and finding the collective noun that God wants you to have in this church, this specific one we're sitting in together right now. Uh, and to make this point full, we're going to go to John 17, as I was read earlier. Uh, John 17, starting in verse uh, 20. Oh, sorry. Good. Uh, John 17. And again, I think this is one of my most favorite parts of Scripture, uh, because before Christ died for you, he prayed for you, specifically for you. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm actually going to have you close your eyes for a moment and just listen as hard as you can. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that they, that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory. The glory you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, that I myself may be in them. I love that prayer so much. And especially because when you think about it, uh, this is towards the end of his life. This is towards the end. And so when I think about if he had a last lesson to teach, I think he'd talk about this. He'd say, I hope that the people who will believe in me through their message, through the disciples that love one another, I pray that they'll have the kind of relationship that you and I have, talking to God, saying there's a unity between us that I want them to be a part of. I in them as you are in me, which is a beautiful thought. So I wonder if this is his last lesson he'd teach. If he came and said, here's my last thing. If I had one last lesson to teach you, here's what it is. Love one another. And the whole world will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And you're going to reach people. And yes, the world's not going to understand, but I'm going to keep on making God known to you. Even though this was the end of his life, he said, I'll keep on making you known. So again, when I think about these collective nouns and these ideas, again, I wonder what, we, what we're called to be here and how we can change people's perspective of us. Now, not to be obsessed with how we're viewed by the world, because the world will always hate some people, no matter what we do. And Christ talks about that, so no, the world hates you, but remember, it hated me first. But doing our best to make sure that we're supplying love for one another, as Jesus commanded. And then the world looks in and sees a unity of Christians, an embrace, a warmth, a compassion, 
and they see how we interact with each other in, in the wild outside these four walls. And they say, yeah, I get it. Look at Christ. Look at his body. Uh, so with that, are there any final questions, comments, anything that you'd like to say? Galatians 16 in there? Oh, okay. Um, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are the, of the household of God. Mm -hmm. Especially to those of the household of God. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. Other thoughts? Yeah. Right, if your last point is uh, to love others, we might as well hit up uh, 1 Corinthians here. I'll read a few verses about love. Come on. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. Other thoughts? Other verses you want to toss in? Anything else? Uh, so just kind of wrap up this evening again. Thank you so much for letting us be here. Uh, and I do pray every blessing over this church and your ministries and everything going on for each of you, uh, that you find that collective noun that God is calling you to be, and that the world can look in on and see you being what Christ wants you to be, and seeing how the world is going to be impacted by you doing what God wants you to be. Uh, together as a church, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so the Walled Lake Church Christ sends their greetings. Hello from them. Uh, and I'll reciprocate if that's okay with you. Um, but in all things, yes, I pray that this church and my church and every church, uh, we don't forget we are one body, one faith, one baptism. Regardless of disagreements, regardless of the next catastrophe to hit earth that splits us up, we still have one thing that binds us all together, and that's an incredible thing to keep. Uh, so with that, let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful to be together. And God, I thank you so much for the incredible and perfect example of love you set down. Uh, Father, when you sacrificed your son and, and he gave up his life on that cross, uh, God, to give us the choice to join you for the rest of our lives on earth and in heaven, uh, God, that is such an unbelievable gift that we could never thank you enough for. Uh, but God, I pray that in the meantime, while we wait uh, here on earth and people look in at us and, and they see the church, we are no longer a hypocrisy or a judgment or a harshness, uh, but God, we can be an, an embrace of Christians and a love of Christians and a unity of Christians and be your hands and your feet as we grow up into your body. Uh, Father, maturing fully and not being blown about by the madness of the world, uh, but instead, God, just reaching our place by you. And Father, I pray every blessing over the Lincoln Park Church of Christ, uh, their ministers and their staff and their people and everyone here. Uh, God, then all things, we continue to grow together and grow into unity like never before. So God, thank you for saving us and showing us grace and mercy. And I pray we do the same, not just for one another, but to everyone that we come across. So they can see, Father, our collective noun is of love and of peace and of mercy and of grace that you shed for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks for being here. Brianna, mind standing back there so people get an opportunity to meet you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I'm so sorry, kids.